everyone and welcome to The Curiosity Show, the show that widens your knowledge of the world around you. I'm Lara. And I'm Megan. And today it's day three of the Nottingham Festival of Science and Curiosity. The festival is a whole week celebrating all things sciencey, and we're here to show you some of the weird and wonderful things that are happening in the world around us. Plus, there's lots of in-person events that are happening at the weekend and over into half term, and you can go to them with your family wherever you are in Nottinghamshire. They're starting to get booked up though, so make sure you head over to our website soon. But first, today's show and another exciting show we've got for you. We're going to learn everything from what chemical reactions happen inside of cars to make them move, to what busy bees buzz around doing all day, and we might even meet Missy the penguin. We've got more challenges and curious demonstrations and lots more fun. I can't wait to get started. So first, let's head over to Michael's allotments to see what he's been doing with his garden. My name is Michael Peacock. I'm a local Sherwood resident. I live just a stone's throw away from, from the allotment site where we are now. I've always been interested in nature. I've always been um, looking to try and find homes for nature. I've also done that professionally as well, working for Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust. I'm currently working for the Woodland Trust, so it just feels like it's a natural extension of what I, what I am and what I should be, really, in terms of you know trying to encourage more people to be a little bit more focused on making homes for nature. I've had a plot here since 2005, um, so I've been on this garden nearly 16 years. When I took it over, it was very overgrown. It hadn't been used for a while. I think where it is now is much more settled as a reflection of me as a gardener. You know, what I want to achieve. It's, it's well cultivated, but it's not manicured. It's got lots of fruit trees, which I like, but I like to think it's a little bit rough around the edges as well. It's a little bit wild. It's got lots of crops that we like eating, like raspberries and gooseberries and, and rhubarb. At this time of year, the primroses and the uh, forget-me-nots are in flower. And of course, I don't think you can quite hear them at the minute, but the chickens are clucking away in the background as well. They're great at eating little scraps as well. They love all the little bits of cabbages that are left over and bits of apple. I've got part of the plot which is definitely for growing food. And then there's those wilder edges. I'd much rather have a few dandelions in the corner and see an early bumblebee and you know on a nice sunny day here there's, there's actually quite a lot of wildlife in what is a really quite urban area. Because we're not a fenced allotment site all the plots are open and then the boundaries are open. A hedgehog even if you're an urban badger you can come and forage on the allotment site and then you can find a way from here to other green spaces which is open as well. This little space here you can imagine that it then suddenly connects to a huge, much bigger area. You know, what we've got here, it's not an isolated pocket, it's connected to lots of other green spaces, whether it's somebody's back garden on one side or whether it's the park on the other. This is a little oasis for everybody who comes down here for wildlife. It's not this little isolated pocket of green, it's actually connected to a really big network of gardens, green spaces, parks, trees and everything else. And it's that gap in the bottom of somebody's fence, it's the, the gate underneath that a hedgehog can crawl under and then it's got this. It's not that difficult to point out to somebody the beautiful butterfly or that there's a family of blue tits just coming out of the nest box. Most common garden birds I've seen here, bullfinches here, the sparrowhawks overhead, tawny owls. The buzzards were only here the other weekend wheeling above. I've seen most of the common butterflies that you would see in urban areas. And there's a family of foxes that frolic on the allotment site and I keep an eye on them but they've never really bothered my chickens. There's bats here as well. It'd be great if somebody could come down here with a bat monitor, if somebody could come down here and just record what we've got. It'd be really interesting to find out what's here. Doesn't that look lovely? And he's so right, getting involved with gardening is such an easy way to get closer to nature. And the students and teachers at Henry Whipple Primary School are seeing just how important it is to do just that. These people have been going out and learning all sorts of different types of leaves 
and creatures that you can find in the garden. They've even managed to find a slug having its lunch and a ladybird sitting on a leaf. Take a look. So this afternoon is about knowing about our environment and what we've actually got on our property. So leaf identification is something that even when they're out with parents, you know, when they're not here and they can go, I know what this leaf is and they can describe it. Look at the different ones. I'm trying to find one. Like this one, look. That is growing so different to how these ones grow when they're on the tree. It's got a little slug. Look at these. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got three different ways that these leaves are growing, haven't you? Yeah, what's Off the stem. He's flying a baby sword. Oh, there's a slug on you. I know, he's enjoying his lunch. There's a little pool inside it. I wish him well. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh jumping, boys. Yeah, let's jump in. Look at the button as well. Near some of it away, you might find them under here. I wonder what you could find it under the stem. What do you think about it? Ten times as much oh, as the amount of the There's a cobweb down there. Um, we learn the lesson that if you disturb something, you put it back how you find it as well. You don't pick the leaves. You can have the leaves that's on the floor. You can have the twigs that's on the floor. You don't go sawing off <laughs> branches and things like that. So it's always really good for them and they just it's their breathing time, it's their time to be curious, it's their time to investigate and nobody's saying you've got to do it this way but they, they find it really interesting. There's no? acorns. Acorns. But have you seen what's growing on our baby oak tree? It's not quite matured yet. Where? Have you seen them? Let's do it. Really, come and have a look. Over there! Yeah. Over there. Have a look at him. Look at his tail. It's evil. It looks like it's got two hooks on it, doesn't it, Wait, on the end? I'm going to go get a magnifying glass. I just glass. tried a wig. Um, I need a wig. No. Uh, get, try and get some no. balls. Which one's yours? No, that's just this one. No, that one's just um, That one's dark, dark as well. Dark one. That's the same. That's the same. Wait, we didn't even need this piece of paper. Emperor. Here's the emperor. This connecting, we're always trying to connect. So it's like we'll do the Van Diagraph. And, you know, we've done that in maths, we've done that in science, and we're doing it in forest schools. So we're trying to show them that these skills that they're getting in life go into other things. Loads of bugs have been eaten. It's been nibbled, has not it? It's got personality. Yeah. 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 Really, yeah. 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 is someone going to keep it on? Yeah. Really? Do you want that one? I'll take that one. Yeah, that's a nice swap. It's fluffy for animals that can sleep in it. No one can sleep in it. Oh, is there a mute to poison you? No, no, I just don't forget to get to take it home with you, though. Back to the office. <laughs> like the hmm? Interesting. <laughs> How would you describe it on the inside? Very tricky. It's patterned. It's intricate. That's a good word. Very. Looks like lots and lots of different layers. It's like an uh, artist actually. Like if you flicked a book and put yeah. pages, if you flicked it, like individual pages all going round. It looks like like the top of the book. Canopy shape, umbrella. Yeah. Maybe it is an umbrella for a slug. I think it's that stop. We're all so busy. Stop. Look at what's going on around you. Look at the differences. Look at the changes. And it's about them talking and communicating um, and just saying, oh, wow, have you noticed this? Because we all walk through life and we see stuff, but we don't actually look at stuff. We don't take in the details. We don't investigate or pick it up. So it's them communicating to each other about the different things that's happening around them. Thank you so much to the pupils at Henry Whipple School for showing us around their garden. It's so great to see the pupils getting out into nature and learning about all the different animals. But I've got a question for you. What species have you been able to find this week? 
I challenge you to go out into your garden and find three different species if you can. Maybe there's a pond near where you live or you might find some interesting animals in a park nearby. Or just by having a look in the leaves and grass you can find some amazing insects. And on the topic of animals, we've got a challenge for you now as it's time for, to play today's Guess That Sound! Let's see if you can guess what animal sound this is. That's a bit of a weird one. Let's hear that one more time. Do you know what sound that is? Find out after the break. I've been a UNICEF ambassador for 18 years and I've been sent to some extreme humanitarian emergencies from the Congo to Afghanistan. Believe me, the people suffering the most in all of them were the children. Today, the war in Yemen is putting over 12 million children in danger. Many children are so sick and malnourished that without food, water, and basic health care, they could die. So we ask, what can we do? We have to do something. One thing we could do is search UNICEF Yemen online or text HELP to 83080 to find out how you can help. Just five pounds could help provide life-saving food to feed a child for a week. I have seen UNICEF's work for myself in extreme emergencies. It saves lives and it saves childhoods. We must act now. I'm pleading with you to give from your hearts. Search UNICEF Yemen online or text HELP to 83080 and help save a child's life today. With Post Office Over 50's life cover, you can have the time of your life. Safe in the knowledge will pay out money when your time is up. UK resident, 50 to 80, your guaranteed acceptance. No health checks and from just £1.15 a week. Plus, you'll even get to choose a £100 gift card. Call Post Office now on 0800 171 2211. Hello and welcome back to the Curiosity Show. Now, before the break, we asked you to guess what animal makes this sound. I thought that was a really tricky one, but the answer is a rhinoceros. Well done if you got that right. Rhinoceros actually means nose horn and their horns are made from the same stuff as our fingernails. But Lara, did you know that baby rhinos are actually born without a horn? I've got to be honest, I never knew that. But from one baby to another, and now we're going to meet Kate. Now, Kate is an obstetrician, which means she delivers babies, and she wants to tell you all about it. I'm an obstetrician, so that means I get to deliver babies for a living. One of my main areas of research is about caesarean births, that's when babies are born through the abdomen with a cut in the womb rather than through the vagina and I'm looking at how to make those births safer. Well it's really varied so in the morning I might be doing caesarean operations in theatre and in the afternoon I might be doing research. I think that is lots of people's perception of research but actually research is really enjoyable, really fun and really straightforward. You just have to study hard to be able to learn all the methods that you need to do research. I'd say go for it, you won't regret it and you'll have the best career ever. I'd take my family because I can't live without them and then if I still had room I'd take my violin because I need to do a lot of practice. So I was really inspired as a child because my parents knew an obstetrician um, and they used to sometimes chat to him and I would hear him answer questions and I'd think wow what an amazing job. I think people think science is, scientists are boring and you know very quiet and maybe don't speak to other people but actually the scientists I work with are the life and soul of the party and so we have a great time at work. 
Um, I really hate sci-fi films. I really can't think of anything else I'd love to be, but I'm, I'd love to see a discovery that uh, helps save the planet. Definitely delivering babies, it's the most wonderful thing in the world and I never get sick of it. We've got lots of different scientists talking to us throughout the week so we can find out what it's like to do their job and what they love about it. Now a lot of scientists are looking to see how we can make science greener. This is to limit the impact it has on the climate. Cars are pretty bad for the planet. This is because they burn petrol so that they can move. These emissions go into the atmosphere and contribute to global warming. By introducing electric cars, car companies are hoping they can make travel less harmful. A scientist from the University of Nottingham is now going to tell us all about cars and how they're trying to make them less damaging for the environment. Take a look. When we fill up at a petrol station or replace our engine oil, what is actually going into our cars? In this video, we're going to learn about the hidden chemistry of cars and other vehicles. Now, you might have heard of food additives, these preserve flavours, appearances and the freshness of our food. Fuels, engine oils and all the other greases and lubricants in vehicles contain additives too. The additive packet is only a small component, but it packs a pretty mighty punch. Now, you might be thinking, but what about electrification? By 2030, the UK will no longer be selling new petrol or diesel cars. But that doesn't mean that existing petrol and diesel cars just disappear. Predictions suggest that in 2040, around 70% of cars will be electric, but that still leaves 900 million internal combustion engines in cars on the roads globally. Fuel additives are one way to help improve their impact. On top of that, all vehicles, electric or not, still need oils and lubricants which contain additives to help them to run smoothly, safely and sustainably. So first, how much of our fuel or engine oil is additive? Well, if this is our fuel, then this is how little the additive package might be. This package will contain a selection of carefully designed additives, each with their own role. So let's have a look at some examples. Firstly, detergents. These work in the same way as washing up liquid. They make sure that any particulate matter is swept away and doesn't clog up narrow valves that would prevent the engine from working properly. They also collect and prevent deposits from forming on surfaces by carrying them away. Corrosion inhibitors keep the metal engine surfaces safe from harm and rust by forming a protective coating. Anti-foam additives do what they say on the tin. They limit foaming. When you take a car to the petrol station, there's a sensor in the fuel dispenser that cuts off when the fuel reaches the top. But if the fuel bounces around on its way down to the tank, the foam will take up space in the tank. And there's all this spare space that could be fuel instead. Finally, markers and dyes can be used to tell the difference between different types or grades of fuel. For example, tractors used only for agricultural use are able to use this red diesel. Some fuels might be identified by colours and others by analytical methods. How can we make them even greener? We as scientists must consider the full life cycle of our products, including the whole manufacture process and the end of life of the chemicals we design. A life cycle assessment looks at the environmental effects of each stage of the process and calculates the energy, materials, carbon dioxide and water footprint. This includes transportation, manufacturing, delivery, as well as the end use. Moving from a linear economy to a circular economy is important to minimise waste and pollution. In chemistry, that means designing reactions using recycled starting materials, so moving away from petrochemicals and towards bio-based materials, looking for energy efficient manufacture methods, that might mean shorter reactions that don't need lots of heat to make a reaction run. Atom efficiency is also really important. Now, this is sustainability on the smallest possible scale. 
atom economy is a measure of how many of the atoms used in a reaction end up in the final product. So, to make a reaction as green as possible, we want to avoid any detours in our chemistry and limit reactions that produce waste or byproducts along the way. We also want to limit the footprint of distribution and design products that are intended for repeated use and can be easily recycled at the end of their useful life. Okay, so now it's time for Guess That Skull. Um, and today we've been borrowing some um, exhibits from the Woolerton Hall Natural History Museum and they've loaned us these exhibits so we can talk to you about different skulls and different animals that we have in our world. So we're going to go through them and see if you can guess what they are as we go along. Okay, we're going to start over this side. Um, what do you at home think this one is? It's quite big and it's got some quite big teeth here as well. Well, the answer is it's a tiger. A tigers are the largest cat in the world and they grow up to 11 feet long and that's about double the size of me. So you can see in on our skull that they have got these big teeth and that's for um, uh, eating, eating meat and catching their prey, so they're really important for um, how they eat and feed. Okay, did you get that one right? Next up, uh, we've got this amazing one over here. Okay, I'm gonna lift this one up. What do you guys think this one is? Um, I think there's a big clue in, at the front of the skull. Uh, it's a walrus. Okay, so walruses live in the North Pole. They live in shallow waters and they're actually um, really sociable creatures. You might have seen photos like this one where they are all living together. Um, unfortunately, uh, walruses have been hunted for their ivory and we can see that's, that's the tusks at the front here, um, as well as their blubber and their meat um, uh, over the course of centuries. They're also at risk at the moment because of the sea temperatures rising. Um, and that's, that's particularly affecting them where they live in the North Pole um, and, and affecting how they can feed and the different ecosystems in their environment. Okay, let's move on to this one, a little bit smaller this time. Uh, we've only got the top part of the skull for this one. What do you guys think that this one is at home? It's a type of monkey and the monkey is called a mandrill. Here we go. We can see in the picture that they've got these really striking blue and red faces. Um, and that's what they're kind of famous for. And actually, if they get more excited, the colours go even, even kind of deeper colour. They also have pouches in their cheeks where they can store food um, so that they can save it for, la for later on when they're, when they're, when they're hungry. Um, and they live in the African rainforest. Um, but again, unfortunately, um, their species is struggling because the rainforests are kind of getting smaller for lots of different reasons, including um, humans cutting down the rainforests. Last up, we've got this little tiny one here. You might have been wondering what this one is. Um, if I hold it here, what do we think it is? It's very small. It's quite sweet. It's a cat. Um, so, so if we compare it to the tiger, you can see it's quite similar looking and it's also got these sharp teeth at the front. And um, that's, uh, you might know if you've got a cat that cats love um, hunting for things, they're natural hunters just like the tigers. So they've still got these um, strong and sharp teeth for catching their prey. Actually, cats have lived with humans for thousands of years. There's evidence of them living alongside Egyptians in ancient Egypt and they've been kind of worshipped um, as well. So I'm going to put that one back down. How did you do on Guess That Skull at Home? Um, I'm going to hand back now over to Lara who's going to talk us through our curiosity board. 
Thanks, Megan. And how weird is it that all of us have one of those right up here? Well, you might remember the Curiosity board that we had yesterday and the day before, and we're adding to it throughout the week so that we can remember all of the amazing stuff that we've learned. And today we've learned about Michael's allotments, and we went to Henry Whipple Primary School where they were looking at all the slugs and lovely insects that they found when they were there, so we'll pop that on the board. We looked at all of the different chemical reactions that were helping to make our cars move along the road, so we'll pop that on as well. But still to come on the show, we're going to meet Missy the Penguin. We're very excited for that bit. We're going to take a trip to the Undiscovered Garden and we're also going to take a look at mining bees. We were coming up on the show, we're going to have a very special guest in the studio as well. But first, a short break. The Watson, director of Watson's Estate Agents, and this is Francesca, Angelina, John and Laura. We're going to be giving you our top five tips for selling your home. Tip one, get your ducks in a row. Uh, start by having a look online, get in a feel for what's out there in the market. Uh, a lot of properties are selling before they even get online, so I would advise you to register with a good local estate agent to get advance notice on uh, some of these properties that are, are going to be coming onto the market, get a good flavour for it. Then ask them out to do a valuation on your own property and that's going to give you a good feel on um, what your budget might be going forward and also that a good reliable local estate agent will have access to a good um, independent mortgage advisor and they will also uh, give you a good sense of your affordability. Tip number two is choose the right estate agent. So it's really important you get this right, have a look around the area and online, see who's selling the most properties in your area and they'll be the agent that will normally have the most buyers on their database. So that's a really good place to start from because you can get viewings even before you get yours online. Um, also think about are they on social media using that, it's a really good tool. Are they on all the major web portals and when are they available to speak to my buyers? Okay, top tip number three is prepare your property. Curb appeal is really important for a first impression to a buyer. So little things like take the car off the driveway to show the space. If there is any clutter, you can see a bit of garden waste there. Just put it away in the bin and, and certainly keep the bin out of view as best you can. So come inside, there'll be some more tips. Okay, so another good first impression, quite a light, spacious hallway. Shoes are all out of the way with a shoe cupboard there, so that's good. As we go through, we've got little Jesse here. Not ideal um, as a distraction when you're trying to show people your home, so uh, try and keep pets out of the way as best you can. So kitchens are a really important room in the house. It can be very costly if you feel it needs replacing and you can't afford it. There is actually an option that you might not be aware of of just recovering the cupboard doors, and that can be done on a budget. So that's worth thinking about. But this one's really nice, simple, uncluttered, nice smells of coffee or bread in the background is always, it's a cliche but it's true, um, but a really important thing is before you think about getting your property on the market, if you are aware of any damp or electrical issues, it's really important you get that sorted first because that's the number one thing that will put buyers off. So my top tip to you would be to work with your estate agent and communicate we're a proactive agent and before your property's hitting the property portal such as Rightmove and Zoopla, we're already mailing it out to thousands of registered buyers that we have on our database. These are your hottest buyers ready to trot. So we need you to communicate, check that your emails aren't going to your junk folder and answer that phone and be flexible with any viewings. My top tips for completing the sale of your home are completing your fixtures and fittings form as quickly as possible. Decide what you're leaving at the earliest stage. Secondly, I would choose a solicitor that has a good working relationship with your estate agent as this is most important in getting the transaction to be as smooth as possible. And lastly, as eager as you are, please do not book your removals until a date is confirmed as until you exchange contracts, their date is not legally binding.
Welcome back to the Curiosity Show, showing you lots of exciting things about the world around you. Now, I'm joined by Susan in the studio, who's an anatomist. Tell me, what is anatomy, Susan? So, anatomy is the study of the body, and in my case, the human body, um, and what's underneath our skin, um, like the skulls we looked at earlier, and all our organs and muscles. Amazing. And what, what do you do as an anatomist? So, mostly I teach students who use anatomy in their job. Uh, how it works and what can go wrong with it. Amazing. And what other jobs need to understand anatomy? Because it's not just you guys studying it, but lots of other scientists too. Yes. So doctors need to know anatomy in order to be able to perform surgery or to be able to, you know, locate a pain. If you've got a pain in your tummy like I have today, where is that coming from? So down here it might be a stone in your kidneys or down here it might be your appendix, for example. Um, and then um, we spend a lot of time uh, teaching other students as well. So nurses who might want to uh, take blood samples or put uh, injections into patients, uh, um, vaccines, for example, yeah. uh, physiotherapists who treat problems with muscles, in those who are disabled or in um, people who have sports injuries and athletes as well who for example in the olympics at the moment will want to get the best out of their bodies yeah definitely and and is it is it all about the muscles that they learn about what specifically would be really important for the team um, that go to the, go with the athletes to the olympics to know about uh, a lot of muscle uh, information is, is really important, but also the nerves that supply those muscles because they'll be responsible for the pain as well. And the brain that controls uh, a lot of um, athlete success is in their muscles and in their physique, but also inside their, their brains and how um, confident and how um, brave they are to be able to uh, overcome these big challenges. And what's your favourite part of um, our, our human body, our anatomy <laughs> that you've studied? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I like the bones because they're hard um, and they're difficult to study. And the prettiest organ is the kidney. Yeah, definitely. Now, I believe you've got a little um, demonstration that we can do with you at home um, on how we can find our heart. Yeah, well, I just thought maybe um, because um, a doctor can't just take a, a knife and open every patient up, they've got to know what's underneath. And we use that by using landmarks on our body. So I thought it might be useful for, for everybody at home to be able to, to try that as well. Yeah, so if course. you just take your finger, you can all do okay. it in the studio as well, and put it just here, you should be able to feel a little groove just here. You can see it on people mm -hmm. as well. And if you follow that down with your fingers, you can feel it coming out and then eventually you reach a ridge and it starts to go back in again. Yeah. So when you've got that ridge found, your heart is, the top of your heart is just underneath that ridge and slightly to the left. So if I find that ridge on myself and move a little bit over, that's the top of my heart. Amazing, I would have never known that. And you know, when we go to the, the doctors or we're feeling poorly, like you mentioned, um, they might ask us to lie down and so they can feel our bellies. Uh, why is that? It's because when you're lying on your back, we can feel our organs a, a lot better. Um, and you can actually feel quite a lot going on inside yourselves. If you just wake up in the morning and have a feel, you, you can feel what you've eaten the day before working its way through sometimes. Um, but it, it's, we're able to then locate the different organs. When we're growing, um, sometimes everything twists around from uh, when we're babies to grown-ups. And sometimes things you feel pain in, in places you don't expect to. And the doctor needs to know that. Definitely. Thank you so much, Susan, You're for joining welcome. us here. That's Susan Anderson, an anatomist. Amazing. Well, we're heading over to the Natural uh, Nottingham Natural History Museum now to meet a lovely feathered friend. This is Missy. This is the penguin that me and my predecessor, Chris Orgill, mounted a couple of years ago. Um, she was a 40-year-old, 43-year-old penguin, I believe, um, and she passed away at Bird Land in Gloucestershire, and they kindly donated her to us. So, as I said, we don't um, accept anything into the collection that hasn't died of natural causes, and Missy is an example of that. Um, so, she was actually found about 30 years ago in South Africa. She was gaffed by fishermen, so they hooked her through the throat. Um, and she survived that, but she, she spent the next 30 years in captivity in zoos um, with a big hole in her throat and her tongue actually hanging out. Um, and that's something that our curator asked us to fill in so that she looked as beautiful as she did before that happened to her. Um, but you can see in the photo behind, um, it shows what she looked like. 
just before, well, a few years before she passed away. And you can see that she's quite hunched and she's walking on her, her heels in the photo. Um, and that's not how they, how they actually tend to walk when they're younger, just because she was an elderly penguin. So we mounted her to look like she did when she was young. Um, the feet are resin casts and the beak is also a resin cast that's been modelled slightly by Chris because, because she was so old her beak was quite shriveled so he modelled over that and painted it but the rest is a real skin. What a lovely display. Now, Megan, I've got a penguin joke for you. I know it's a bit of a classic, but what do penguins like to wear to the beach? I don't know. What do penguins like to wear to the beach? A bikini. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you've got a joke. I've got a fact for you. Um, what percentage of Antarctica is made up of penguin wee? I don't know, 0.0005%. It's loads more than that. It's 3%. 3%, even yeah. with all that water? Yeah, I know. Um, so let's move away from penguins. Um, how about uh, a trick show, um, using a slinky, uh, making sound effects from slinkies? We've got Rick here to show you exactly how. Hello, everyone. So today, the experiment is all about sound, and particularly how sound waves reach our ear. So many of you, I'm sure, will have seen a slinky. You might even have been given one for Christmas. It's a great toy. But did you know that this is how they made the sound effects for science fiction programmes and films before you had computers? What I've done is, look, I've found this plastic tub and I've made a hole in the bottom and I've threaded the end of the slinky through the bottom of the pot like this. Now, listen what happens when I drop the slinky. Ready? Wow. Isn't that like lasers or Star Wars? Now, if you've got a smaller one and just a plastic cup, you can make the same sound effect. It's not as loud and it's not as deep as the bigger one. Well, that will tell you something. But what's happening is that we're making the air inside the cup vibrate. And it's acting like an amplifier and that's the sound that's reaching your ears. It's good, isn't it? And some of you may know the trick as well. If you've got two pieces of string and a metal object from the kitchen or from a, somewhere else at home, if you tie the loops of string to the object and then pop your fingers in your ears like this, and then tap it with the dinger. The sound waves travelling up the string into your ear will make it sound like you're inside the biggest bell, the biggest bell of the council house here in Nottingham. It's a great trick. Try it on your friends when you get home. Now we're coming to you live from Nonsuch Studios and in their prop cupboard they have this which works on the same principle as Rick Slinky. And it sounds like thunder, isn't that amazing? It's amazing and from one crazy science to another let's go discover the undiscovered island. The intentions of the company makers of Imaginary World, we work with a number of artists and creative technologists when we work and we wanted to create, especially for the outside, to use um, interactions that will bring colour and sound. So if you sit on a chair, you get stories. That was written by oh, um, 
uh, by Sam Wells. Um, and then when you step on different aspects of the floor, you, the coals will light up or they will make wonderful sounds. We try to keep a lot of the interactions touchless actually in this one as well um, and so that was quite useful and inside you talk to the calls or you make sounds and the calls will light up so it's all about the kind of relation your relationship with the uh, sculptures when children come in they get a passport and they are, are become explorers in this undiscovered island so we have things like small fossils of um, um, fishes and um, even a feather coral um, fossils around for children to explore and find out so part of it is really for children to kind of figure out we don't have any signs on so you have to kind of try and figure out oh if I stand on that oh something's happening oh this is making sounds so we try to keep um, the curiosity try to gain some curiosity from children by using interactions that they might happen upon <laughs> yes indeed The artist Roma Patel, who created the Undiscovered Island last year, has created a new display this year called the Garden of Just Because. This is a really cool place to visit because it's all about mushrooms and how different trees can speak to each other. It's on show this Saturday at Woolerton Hall and then at the Broadway Theatre next Monday to Saturday. So if you're interested in exploring the Garden of Just Because, please visit our website www.notsfosac.co.uk. Tickets are already going, so you need to get in there quick. Now, we've got another challenge for you before the break. We've been given lots of pictures of funky objects and things from the University of Nottingham School of Life Sciences imaging facility. These were taken through a microscope, and we want you to guess what they are. So here's the image we've got today. Um, it's a bit, little bit different from what we've had in the previous few days, but um, have a look, and we'll give you the answer after the break. The I'm Helen and I'm Kerry and we run the Little London Herbal Stores and we're here to give you our five top winter health tips. My top tip for looking after my skin during the winter is to use the Willida Skin Food. I like to use this on my elbows, on my hands when they're chapped and also for flip-flop season in the summer when you get the hard skin on your heels. It's a really really thick cream that goes in lovely. It's not for everyday use, but for everyday, we've got the Skin Food Body Lotion, which you can use all over after your shower, and the Skin Food Light, which goes under your makeup. My next top tip is to take the Immune Boost Tablet by Nature's Plus. It's a one a day tablet that contains your vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C and mushrooms to help keep your immune system healthy and keep away colds and flus. And did you know that some mushrooms are really good for helping increase your immune system and also helping with respiratory issues? So this is my favourite top tip and this is Echinacea in a hot drink. Echinacea is really good for boosting the immune system and fighting coughs and colds. All you need to do is pop a teaspoon of the liquid in a cup, pour on boiling water and you've got a really soothing, comforting drink that's going to have a lot of health benefits. Another of my top health tips is to take vitamin D liquid. Vitamin D is important all year round, but especially during the winter months as we don't get it from the sunshine. I like the liquid version better because it seems to be easier absorbed and it also tastes quite nice and it's a bit different from taking a tablet every day. So this is my top tip for sore throats. This is really, really good if you've got a sore throat. You just rip the top off and drink the contents and it coats your throat, it coats the mucous membranes 
it's it's not horrible like a lot of preparations that you use. It's quite um, lemony, minty sort of thing, but it really takes away the sore throat quickly. You know what really irritates me? Ordinary pads and tampons full of plastic and chemicals. You know what doesn't irritate me? Organic pads, tampons and liners. O-R-G-A-N-Y-C. They're clinically proven to protect my sensitive skin with 100% certified organic cotton. And they provide unsurpassed absorbency too. Organic. O-R-G-A-N-Y-C. The only clinically proven feminine care brand. Hmm. What a comforting thought. And welcome back to the Curiosity Show. Before the break, we were looking at a picture that some scientists in Nottingham have been looking at this week. Here it is again. Now this is an image of micro cell division. This is where two cells which make up all of our body multiply by splitting up and becoming two separate cells. Everything in our body is made up of cells and we can't see them, but it just shows how close a microscope can zoom in. Sometimes it really is amazing how much we know from science. Earlier in the week, we had a look at wasps and what they're useful for, and now we're going to look at their buzzing friends, bees. But not just any type of bee, a type of bee called a mining bee. We can be keeping an eye out for a few more of them as it starts to get warmer into the springtime. Time for something completely different now. So let's take a look at the bees. <laughs>
weird that those bees have their nests in the ground. So that science can make new discoveries, it has to move with the times. And now they use more and more technology in labs and research centres to help make these discoveries. But technology can also help us enjoy science a little more. A project that's happening in Sherwood Forest is helping people become part of a 5G action. And when people put on their headset, they're transported into the deep depths of Sherwood Forest. Here they can shoot arrows and experience the forest through a headset from anywhere in the world. So what we've shown you today is we believe the world's first ever interactive hologram experience. So what we do is we use these headsets to project holograms into the real world like you might see in Star Wars or a Marvel film. So in Sherwood Forest we're going to use this to bring Robin Hood to life. So we're going to bring Robin Hood, Marion, we're also going to bring Little John to life and a whole cast of characters from the legend that we're going to bring using these holographic headsets. So you actually get to see these characters in front of you and you actually be able to interact with them. Yeah, so we'll use 5G. So what we have is we have the content is going to be stored on a server and then during the experience it'll be interactive. So users can tap a button to make story decisions and they can also uh, vote on those. So basically what it uses is 5G. So if you have a group of say like 10 people and three people vote and you know seven vote for another one, you'll see the experience that the majority have voted for and then that will use the 5G network to deliver that experience. Yes, yeah, definitely a world first. We don't think anyone else has done this before. So the people might have seen holograms on stage, but actually they're projections. What this actually does is it puts a real hologram in front of you, but also it's an interactive movie and experience. So you get to see live actors and you, know, you can hold your hand out, you can shoot arrows, the actors fire arrows at you as well. So like if you've seen a 3D, 3D movie where uh, something pops out at you, this is different. This is actually an arrow will fly past your head and you'll be able to look behind you and see that, where that arrow goes. We've got some trials coming up soon. So in the next sort of couple of months, we'll be getting people to Sherwood Forest. We'll be trialing it, getting their feedback, uh, reacting to that and making updates accordingly. And then it's going to be available to visitors in Sherwood Forest. One, if there's a few key things here. One, it's a world first. So, and people might have seen AR before on their phones. They might have seen VR, but they won't have seen a holographic experience like this. The other thing as well is that it's outside in the forest. So we're using 5G that enables us to actually bring it into the forest area, which again is going to be something no one's ever experienced before. Time now for our final demonstration of the episode. Have you already tried doing our balancing bird and the other activities that we did yesterday? Send us your photos uh, in on social media, we'd love to see them. But first up, we're going to be doing this experiment, and this is one that we're going to leave overnight. So it's not something that we're going to see the results from immediately, and that's like what a lot of science is. You've got to be quite patient, you've got to wait. Um, so we'll come back to this tomorrow. So what I, I've got here is I've got seven glasses uh, lined up in a row, and I'm going to fill them all up with water. You can also use plastic cups or anything else that you'll be able to see the colours uh, go through. So I'm going to fill these all up about halfway. And almost done. There we go. And then I've got three different food colourings. I've got a red, I've got a blue and I've got a yellow. So you need these three colours. I'm going to fill the, the, put the red in the two end ones. Then I'm going to leave one empty. And then in this one, I'm going to put the blue in. And then in this one, I'm going to put the yellow in. So what we're going to see happen here um, is the colours transfer into these empty ones. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some kitchen roll that I've rolled up. So how I've done that is I've folded it in half and then folded it in half again, and then one more time, and then halfway in the middle. So I can put this side in one glass and this side in the other glass. So I'm gonna pop all of these in across all of my colors. There we go. Keep going, and then we'll come back tomorrow and we'll start to see if 
some, some of the colour transfer. You can already start to see some of the dye transferring up here and, and coming into the next one. And we'll hopefully we'll see the different colours that will come into these glasses. So please do try this along with us at home. We'd love to see your own uh, versions of this. Um, maybe you could try different colours, you could try really big glasses of water, you could try all sorts of different things. And remember, science is about being curious, it's about asking questions, it's about testing and trying to find out the answer rather than necessarily always just looking it up online. So we love doing experiments here at the Festival of Science and Curiosity. If you're interested in getting involved and getting hands on with science, there's lots more that you can do across the whole week of the festival. Check out our website, www.notsfosac.co.uk. Uh, we've got lots of events across libraries, across um, the whole of the county, from Worksop to Retford to Bulwell to St Anne's, um, where you can do experiments like this and really get hands on in science. So we'll come back to this tomorrow. We're going to leave this right here. We're not going to do anything with it and we'll see if it's worked. Over to you, Laura. So that's all we've got time for on today's Curiosity Show, I know, but we'll be back here tomorrow, so don't worry. Remember, if you did enjoy anything on the show, head over to our website. We've got lots of information on the events that are going on, even the Garden of Just Because. Now, I know Woolerton is booked up, um, but take a look. You might be able to head over on the Monday through to the Saturday. Remember, we want to see lots of pictures and videos of everything you've been doing, making your slinkies, doing the water diffusion. So at Knots Fosac on social media, using the hashtag Curious Knots, get in touch. We'll see you tomorrow at the same time, at the same place, four till five o'clock on Knots TV for even more science and curiosity. Bye. Bye.